Uh, good evening, everybody. And today, I'm really thankful to the entire team of Hormone India for inviting me for this wonderful uh, program to connect with people across the country and, in fact, the globe. Uh, covering on a very, very important topic of neonatal hypoglycemia. And we all know that hypoglycemia is a common condition. Most of it is a transitional scenario in which not much uh, revaluation is required. Largely, we talk about uh, the management of hypoglycemia, but in certain scenarios, it can become complicated, which I'll highlight through these two cases, which makes it really relevant in terms of the appropriate evaluation and management of these uh, conditions. So we have the six day old girl with hypoglycemia who had a birth weight uh, which was normal, ketones were negative. So there was a non-ketotic hypoglycemia. The reducing substances were negative in this scenario. And there was a confusion because insulin was detectable. Growth hormone levels and cortisol levels were also low for that particular timing as far as hypoglycemia is concerned. Now, when we talk about critical samples, we all know that we have to use specific cutoffs. So we expect the growth hormone to be above 10 and cortisol to be above 550. During hypoglycemia, we also expect insulin to be undetectable. So what is this case really? Is it hyperinsulinism because insulin is detectable? Or is this a multiple predatory hormone deficiency wherein we have got an inappropriately low level of growth hormone and cortisol for the level of hypoglycemia? And that is something which is very, very relevant from that perspective. The child was diagnosed as multiple predatory hormone deficiency. But when we looked at the other parameters like ketones being negative, we thought that this is unlikely to be a pituitary problem and we thought of hyperinsulinism. And then we conducted a glucagon response and gave glucagon, which resulted in an increase in glucose levels, suggesting this was hyperinsulinism rather than a multiple predatory hormone deficiency. So while we are evaluating individuals for neonatal hypoglycemia, we need to consider the holistic clinical picture and use tools which may cause more definitive diagnosis in certain scenarios. So neonatal hypoglycemia is common. Approximately one in 40 children will have it. Most of this is physiological in the first 48 hours of life when there is transition happening, but there can be a significant pathology of which hyperinsulinism and multiple predatory hormone deficiencies are the most important causes from a chronic perspective. So we'll dwell a bit on that regards. This unfortunately is often missed or missed with significant consequences in that regards. So over the next 15 or 20 minutes or so, I'll talk a bit about the pathophysiology of neonatal hypoglycemia. It causes evaluation and particularly about how to assess, approach and manage these cases. All of you can go and have a look at our website, learning.growsociety.in, which has got a lot of resources related to pediatric endocrinology, including a number of courses, which include fellowship and diploma courses, both hybrid, online and offline mode. We have got publications which provide a summary of all these courses, along with the mobile application, which provides instantaneous guidance and point of care assessment and management of complicated pediatric endocrine disorders. So to so start off, we all know that the fetus is entirely dependent on glucose as far as energy needs is concerned. And this glucose entirely comes from the mother through a passive gradient using the glute transporter. So 80% of energy needs of the fetus are made by the glucose and fetus is in a state in which it is wanting to build the overall body having an anabolic phase to ensure this. There is two very important mechanisms. One, insulin cannot cross the placenta. And this is important because if it crosses, it will have a devastating impact in situations where there is a maternal increase in insulin level, let's say, because of insulin resistance. The second important thing to remember is that during pregnancy, so as to extract the maximum amount of glucose from the mother, the placenta produces the hormone known as HPL, human placental lactogen, which induces insulin resistance raising the glucose levels in the mother and this provides a greater amount of glucose to enter the fetal circulation. So fetus has got a lot of glucose when you have excess of metabolite, when you don't have to use it, you will store it. So this stimulates insulin secretion and inhibits glucagon. And it is this increased insulin to glucagon ratio in the fetal period, which really causes fetal growth along with glycogen deposition. Now, most of this glycogen deposition happens in the last trimester. So preterm babies would have a higher chance of hypoglycemia because they have less glycogen stored, so to begin with. 
Now, as soon as the birth happened, there is a watershed area. You are continuously getting supply from the mother and this is cut. So you have to depend upon all the resources the fetus had accumulated over the last nine months or so. So in this scenario, there will be, of course, a dip to begin with. And the first response to happen is the secretion of counter-regulatory hormone epinephrine, which will cause decrease in insulin. And this will also cause increased level of glucagon, resulting in production of glucose, largely through glycogenolysis, gluconeogenesis, and very limited aspect of lipolysis, particularly in the first day of life. So in the first day of life, hypoketosis is a norm. So while we say ketone is a very, very important investigation as far as workup of hypoglycemia, we should remember that in the first day of life, ketone levels may actually be low throughout the time and we don't need to worry or get concerned about that in that perspective. Now, as discussed, there's always a dip which happens around two hours of life as far as glucose levels and then they stabilize by 48 hours. So what I'm trying to say is that in the first 48 hours, it is very likely that there may be a hypoglycemia which may happen because of a maladaptation. This will be particularly likely if somebody is preterm with reduced store, somebody who is SGA, somebody who has a lot of perinatal stress. But beyond 48 hours, the entire mechanism of glucose regulation, including the four counter-regulatory hormones, glycogenolysis, gluconeogenesis and lipolysis are established. So after 48 hours of life, we can say that this neonate from a physiological perspective has nearly become an adult and should be able to sustain at least six hours of fasting, which should not cause hypoglycemia. So any problem in the first 48 hours may be transitional. Beyond that, we have to think of pathology. Now, this dip is much higher in preterm infants, and this is something which we all are aware that they are more risk of hypoglycemia from that perspective. So when we talk about glucose metabolism, we talk about three major organs, liver, which is a major store of glycogen, kidneys, which produce a lot of glucose through the alternate sources through gluconeogenesis, and of course, the fatty tissue, which produces ketone, which is an alternate source of energy in that perspective. Now, the major hormones which regulate, of course, there is one hypoglycemic hormone, insulin, which causes reduction in glycogenolysis, gluconeogenesis, and lipolysis. And there are four counter-regulatory hormones, glucagon, cortisol, epinephrine, and growth hormone, which contribute differentially with regards to increased lipolysis, glycogenolysis, gluconeogenesis, and inhibition of glycogen synthesis. And all these processes contribute to increased glucose levels. So the physiological evolution clearly is in the form of one scenario wherein the hormone that causes hypoglycemia is only single. There are four counter-regulatory hormone. Hence, deficiency of one of those counter-regulatory mechanisms is not expected to cause hypoglycemia. You need to have a combination of at least two hormones. That is why only when you have multiple predatory hormone deficiency will you have hypoglycemia. So from an endocrine perspective, hypoglycemia can happen if you have excess of hypoglycemic hormone that is insulin or deficiency of hyperglycemic hormones, namely growth hormone and cortisol. Epinephrine and glucagon deficiency do not occur in a primary scenario. They are largely manifestation of long-standing type 1 diabetes where there is a hypoglycemic unawareness which happens in that perspective. The typical presentation, however, if you talk about hyperinsulinism would be one in which body is needing a lot of glucose. So you need to have a high glucose infusion rate, typically about 12 milligram per kg per minute. And because the ketone production is inhibited, you will have non-ketotic hypoglycemia. On the other hand, deficiency of the endocrine system will result in ketotic hypoglycemia. And if there is a combined defect, you will also have hyponatremia, which is common. Glycogen storage disease typically do not present in the neonatal period. They will present with delayed onset ketotic hypoglycemia with significant hepatomegaly, while fructose-based phosphonate defects are extremely unlikely. Multiple predatory hormone deficiency will cause hypoglycemia along with micropenis, midline defects along with cholestasis, and fatty acid uh, oxidation defects will cause episodic hypoketotic hypoglycemia. This brings us to the central point that the most important investigation in a child who presents to you with hypoglycemia is the ketone levels. If a child is hypoglycemic, he should be ketotic. If the ketones are absent, we are dealing with either hyperinsulinism 
or fatty acid oxidation defect in perspective. So neonatal hypoglycemia can be classified into decreased production, where if you just give the routine physiological replacement of 6 mg per kg per minute, you're fine in terms of response or increased utilization where the glucose requirements become a bit more. Decreased production can be because of a substrate defect like prematurity or small for gestational age or because of a metabolic defect like endocrine deficiencies, which are multiple predatory hormone deficiency associated with features like micropenis, cleft lip, cleft pellet, neonatal cholestasis, or metabolic defects which present with hypoketotic in the form of galactosemia, which has cataract as an important association. Increased utilization can be because of increased need because of sepsis or cardiac failure or hyperinsulinism, which is the most common chronic form or persistent form of hypoglycemia in the neonatal period. This is typically non-ketotic. It may be transient because of maternal diabetes, uh, RH incompatibility and intake of drugs, typically resolved by one to two weeks of life. Prolonged form typically resolving in six to eight weeks of life. And this is one of the most common causes typically seen in a small for gestational age stressed infant who has hypoxia, which induces the pancreatic growth causing hypoglycemia. And finally, the persistent form, which include the genetic causes, the potassium ATP defect, along with the other metabolic parameters, which are lifelong. So essentially, if we talk about chronic hypoglycemia, we're talking about hyperinsulinism. Small for gestational age, stress baby, think more of a prolonged hyperinsulinism, severe hyperinsulinism, which is persistent, think of a potassium ATP channel defect in that regards. Other differentials, of course, easy to identify. If you have micropenis, midline defect, cholestasis, think of endocrine defect. If there is cataract, hepatomegaly, think of uh, a possibility of a galactosemia in that regards. The most important clinical clue, of course, is how much glucose are you needing in that perspective. Now, inherent forms can be because of the defects in the on-off button of insulin secretion, which is the potassium ATP channel. This could be a mutation in the KCNJ11 or ABCC8. These typically are severe forms associated with the macrosomia and they do not respond to dioxide. And as we'll discuss, dioxide responsiveness is a very, very important clue overall with regards to the diagnosis in that perspective. Now, we now identify that inheritance decides about the way a child with hyperinsulinism will behave. So if there is a paternally inherited mutation, it is more likely to have a focal form which can be removed and surgery can be done. While if it is a recessive mutation, it is usually a diffuse form in which the whole pancreas is to be removed in that perspective. So if you have a diazoxide non-responsive hyperinsulinism, get a urgent genetics done, which will give you a diagnosis. If you have a paternal gene defect, it will be a focal form. While if it is a recessive form, you need to do a more comprehensive pancreatectomy in that perspective. Other defects include glucose sensing in the form of glucokinase, GDH defect, which causes hyperammonemia. So ammonia levels, if they are high, will give a clue towards this diagnosis. And you, of course, have this CAD defect in that regards. So now we have discussed about the various forms of hypoglycemia. The key questions now are, is it hypoglycemia? What is the classification, decreased production or increased utilization? And finally, what's the cause? So for hypoglycemia, we need to understand that we need to have a broad index of suspicion. Any clinical features, a child not appearing well could be a feature of hypoglycemia, but particularly if there are seizures, unexplained cardiac failure, apnea, think of hypoglycemia. Plus, we need to be cautious to identify it at the right time in infant or diabetic mother, pre and post term, large or small for gestational age, birth asphyxia or sepsis, cardiac defects and micropenic. These all infants need to have a careful evaluation of the glucose level, particularly in the first 48 hours of life as we discussed earlier. Now, when we talk about further evaluation, so we have established hypoglycemia. Do we evaluate everybody? No. Beyond 48 hours with high glucose requirement and absence of risk factor makes it very important to evaluate from that perspective. Now, we need to remember that there are no particular cutoffs as far as hypoglycemia is concerned in newborn period because we cannot have the typical Whipple stride because symptomatology and response is different. So we use operational thresholds as to when should we worry about glucose levels. So glucose levels which are below 25 in the first four hours 
between 4 to 24 hours, between below 35, 24 to 48 hours, below 50, and beyond that, below 60 are a cause of concern. Of course, if an infant has a low glucose level and is symptomatic, these issues do not matter. You have to evaluate. But if somebody is asymptomatic, you have to use 25 in the first four hours, 35 between four to 24 hours, 50 between the next two, uh, 24 to 48 hours, and then finally below 60 in that perspective. Now, once we know that this is hypoglycemia, the question is, is it decreased production or increased utilization? Look for GIR. In general, if it is a production issue, you give 6 mg per kg per minute, you would be able to maintain glucose. But if the utilization is high, the GIR will be high in that regards. Now, finally, the cause. So start with the birth weight. If a child is macrosomic, it means there is an antenatal insulin excess. It is either a diffuse potassium ATP defect or a Beckwith-Withman syndrome in that regards. Low birth weight suggests prolonged hyperinsulinism because of SGA, while normal birth weight suggests rarer forms of hyperinsulinism. Transient forms can be because of maternal drugs like beta blocker and tabitalin, RH incompatibility or birth asphyxia and maternal diabetes. Prolonged forms can happen in the two to six week phase with asphyxia, particularly SGA and prematurity and cardiac illness in that regards. If there is micropenis, think of a multiple predatory hormone deficiency or rarely adrenal hypoplasia congenita. If there is hepatomegaly, think of hyperinsulinism, beckwith wiedemann syndrome, and galactosemia. If there is pigmentation, think of congenital adrenal hypoplasia or adrenal hypoplasia congenita in that regard. And of course, if there is cataract, think of galactosemia. If there is neonatal cholestasis, think of multiple predatory hormone deficiency in galactosemia. So a careful clue to look for genital examination eye for icterus, skin for pigmentation, and the liver examination will give you a diagnosis in most scenario. Now, coming on to the most important part of evaluation, always look at the critical sample. So when a child has hypoglycemia, we expect the insulin levels to be undetectable, the ketone levels to be more than 2, the cortisol level to be more than 550, and growth hormone should be more than 10. This is what critical sample is. So you have to collect these samples when somebody has hypoglycemia. Now, in that scenario, if insulin is detectable, this suggests hyperinsulinism. If ketone is low, think of insulin, galactosemia or fatty acid oxidation defect. If lactate is there, think of a rarer form of glycogenic defects, which are unlikely at this age group. High cortisol or low cortisol or low growth hormone will suggest multiple predatory hormone deficiency. So always interpret these critical samples with regards to the timing of the sample in that scenario. Undetectable insulin. So look at other parameters of hyperinsulinism in the form of a high C-peptide, a hypoketotic state, and a glucagon response, which is the gold standard, which we showed in our first case in that scenario. Other clues could be hypokalemia and a high GIR. So don't just go for insulin levels. Even if the insulin levels are low and you have a high suspicion of hyperinsulinism, look at C-peptide, which is a more robust marker. Look at ketone in that perspective. So finally, about approach. If your ketone is low or absent, look at reducing substance. If it is positive, it is galactosemia or fructose intolerance. If it's negative, look at insulin levels. Undetectable insulin is fatty acid oxidation defect and detectable is hyperinsulinism. If the ketone levels are high, look at lactate levels. If it's high, it's GSD1 or gluconeogenic defect. If it's normal, look for organomegaly to identify rare forms of GSD and finally go for cortisol and growth hormone. So ketone is the most important investigation. Absent ketone, absent reducing substance, go for insulin in that scenario and you will identify that. We'll quickly run through a few cases uh, to I'll finalize this uh, presentation. A three week old boy with seizures and hypoglycemia. Ketones were present. Lactate level were normal and there is hyponatremia. So there are two defects, hyponatremia and hypoglycemia. So we look into micropenis and this clearly suggests that this is a multiple predatory hormone deficiency. Three week old boy again with failure to thrive, hypoglycemia, low glucose requirement with hepatomegaly. Now, this is an important clue. So, there is hepatomegaly, ketones are negative. So, now we start thinking of hyperinsulinism. 
But before that, we have to look at other aspects. So hype, three week presentation, irritability, hepatomegaly, non-ketotic, always think at the possibility of galactosemia, which was present in this scenario. 14 day old boy with birth asphyxia in the ICU, hypoglycemia, high glucose requirement, indicating more towards hyperinsulinism, non-ketotic, detectable insulin. So this is hyperinsulinism, but remember this is a SCA who has birth asphyxia. This is a prolonged form and you have to be careful in terms of evaluation probably will require dioxide for some time. 12 day old boy with lethargy, again hypoglycemia, which So look carefully. And dioxide. So how do you manage a child with hyperinsulinism? If it's transient or prolonged, think of dextrose and dioxide. If it is persistent, then go for dioxide treatment. Start from 5 mg per kg per day, go up to 15 mg per kg per day. And if it's present, you continue dioxide. Look at ammonia to identify the hyperammonemia syndrome. If there is no dioxide response, this is an emergency. Best to get an immediate potassium ATP genetics which if shows are recessive defects, suggests that you can give either octreotide or do a palliative surgery after you have because there is no other option. If there is a paternal defect or there is no defect or there is Beckwith-Weedman syndrome, better to go for an imaging modality like fluorodopa PET, which if suggests a focal lesion requires surgical resection, if there is a diffuse lesion requires palliative surgery. So management largely depends upon dioxide responsiveness and genetics now has changed the way we manage in that perspective. So on follow-up, on a good dose of dioxide, no response, hypoglycemia persistent, started on glucagon, potassium ATP defect was found, and this child will require a lot of management in terms of surgery or other management. 10-day-old boy with hypoglycemia, birth weight was normal, GIR was high, non-ketotic, so this is again hyperinsulinism started on a dioxide on follow-up good response good dose no response so they were found to have a paternal potassium atp defect so this is a likelihood of a focal form of hyperinsulinism so here better to get a fluorodopa pet which can be removed so if there's a focal lesion you remove it the child will be fine from that perspective 15 day old girl with hypoglycemia birth weight was 3200 gram high gir non-ketotic insulin level slightly high. So this again is hyperinsulinism which we're looking at and ammonia is high. So this is the hyperinsulinism, hyperammonemia syndrome. So just to summarize, hypoglycemia is common in the neonatal period if it is persisting beyond 48 hours of age. If there is, uh, uh, along with that, you have got other features which are just chronic causes you need to evaluate if the GIR is more than 12. The most important evaluation is blood ketones which decide about further evaluation. Ketone negative, think of hyperinsulinism, fatty acid oxidation defect, while if it is ketone positive, think of an endocrine cause versus a, a, a organic acidemia in that perspective. Very importantly, when you diagnose hyperinsulinism, remember that insulin levels are not very reliable. Look at other markers, high GIR, negative ketones, along with a good glucagon response, which may give you a clue in that perspective. If you diagnose hyperinsulinism, which is prolonged or persistent, start on dioxide. If there is no dioxide response, then you should go ahead with a further evaluation for genetic study, which will guide whether it is a diffuse form of a permanent form. So basic evaluation, identification of hypoglycemia at the right time, evaluation for hypoglycemia causes and management becomes important on that perspective. So at that point of time, I'd like to thank uh, all the uh, viewers for this patient hearing and thank Hormone India again for inviting me for this presentation.